Leonardo da Vinci is probably the most famous painter of the Renaissance period. Yet he is only known for around 15 pieces. His first piece that really showed his genius was Last Supper, probably the most famous religious painting in the world. It has dimensions of 15 feet by 29 feet. Leonardo captures the moment just after Christ tells his apostles that one of them will betray him and at the institution of the Eucharist. The effect of his statement causes quite a visible response. There is clearly a wave of emotion among the twelve apostles. Each apostle seems to have his own reaction to the news despite the drama that is present in the image. Da Vinci has managed to maintain a kind of order in the scene. Christ is in the middle of the image, breaking the news while looking solemnly at the floor. His head is the, the vanishing point toward which all lines of perspective lead. The apostles are arranged around him in groups of three, similar in their postures and their gestures. Judas, on the far right, our far right, is set apart from the other apostles by his shadowed face, alluding to the fact that Judas was the one who betrayed Christ for the payment of 30 silver coins. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa is probably the most recognizable painting in the world. It took him over four years to complete. The painting presents a woman in a half-body portrait with dimensions of two feet six inches by around one foot nine inches. The background is distant with mountains, winding paths and water. There's a stark contrast between the jagged mountains and her soft, oval-shaped face. The muted colours of her hair and dress contrast with the light colour of her face give her skin a radiant quality. The light in the painting is soft, creating an attractive atmosphere. There's something kind of grand in her posture and the detail of her dress. She's calm, but commanding. The use of perspective is also an important part of the painting, with the lines all leading to a single vanishing point behind Mona Lisa's head, just like Christ in Da Vinci's Last Supper. Mona Lisa's half-smile is famous, mysterious, and the meaning of it has long been debated. For me, there's something secretive and cunning about it. Here's a short passage by Victoria era writer Walter Pater, whose words on the Mona Lisa resonated with me. We all know the face and the hands of the figure, set in its marble chair, in that circle of fantastic rocks, as in some faint light under sea. Perhaps of all ancient pictures, time has chilled it the least. The presence that thus rose so strangely beside the waters is expressive of what, in the ways of a thousand years, men had come to desire. Hers is the head upon which all the ends of the world are come, and the eyelids are a little weary. It is a beauty wrought out from within upon the flesh, the deposit, little cell by cell, of strange thoughts and fantastic reveries and exquisite passions. Set it for a moment beside one of those white Greek goddesses or beautiful women of antiquity, and how would they be troubled by this beauty, into which the soul, with all its troubles, has passed. Next, we have another da Vinci painting, Virgin of the Rocks.
created around 1486. Its dimensions are 6 feet by around 4 feet. Mary would usually be seen seated on the throne in heaven, yet here she is presented as a kind of Madonna of humility, like she is in other works, sitting on the ground like anyone else would. The Virgin Mary is the primary figure at the top of a kind of pyramid of figures. She's embracing a child in her right arm, John the Baptist, who is praying to the other figure, Christ, as a child. On the right side, there is an archangel. The position of Mary's body is graceful. She tilts her head right, while her hips, her hips move left. One arm is out, while one arm is in. The position of her body and the composition of the painting as a whole is very complex, which is very typical of the Renaissance period. Like the Last Supper, and particularly like the Mona Lisa, the colors of the figures in da Vinci's work have a kind of smoky quality to them. There aren't such obvious outlines of the figures, as if they have emerged out of the darkness. This quality gives them a uniquely soft and elegant look. The School of Athens is a fresco created in 1509 by Raphael. It is 16 feet by 25 feet. It represents all the greatest mathematicians, philosophers and scientists from classical antiquity with a couple painters in there also. There are a total of 21 distinct figures set against the backdrop of a school. They are gathered together under one roof despite living in different time periods. They are sharing ideas and learning from one another, engaged in conversation, work and fun. There are two central figures in the middle of the fresco. Aristotle on the right and Plato on the left. The linear perspective of the piece creates the illusion of depth. With one hand, Plato is pointing upwards to heaven, the place where all ideas come from, while Aristotle seems to be pointing toward the ground, holding his book of ethics. Plato points up because, in his philosophy, the changing world that we see around us is just a shadow of a higher, truer reality that is eternal and unchanging and include things like goodness and beauty. For Plato, this otherworldly reality is the ultimate reality and the seat of all truth, beauty, justice and wisdom. Aristotle holds his hand down because in his philosophy, the only reality is the reality that we can actually see and experience by sight and touch. Exactly the reality dismissed by Plato. Aristotle's Ethics, the book that he is holding, emphasized the relationships, justice, friendship and government of the human world and the need to study those things. Raphael included himself in the image, looking directly at the viewer, almost his way of signing it. Alba Madonna is another piece by the Renaissance artist Raphael, created around 1510. The Virgin Mary sits with the young Christ on her lap. This painting is unusual in its depiction of Mary. Her arms are extended in a way that suggests she is almost providing a kind of seat or, or rather even a throne for Christ to sit on. 
it's it's interesting also to see the influence of Virgin on the Rocks. The other piece we looked at, that piece's influence in this piece, and Leonardo da Vinci's influence on Raphael in general. It's almost the same group of figures from Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks. However, the angel isn't present in Raphael's painting. These quite obvious expressions of the divine that we saw in Virgin of the Rocks have been replaced almost by nature itself in Raphael's piece. Mary has her right leg tucked under her left leg as if she's almost been caught in the act of moving. Like in Virgin on the Rocks, they are moving gracefully, almost like they are dancing. The, the framing of it is tight and circular, yet it feels as though they have freedom to move. But the three of them do occupy nearly all of the image, making them seem monumental, commanding and serious. The Four Apostles was painted by Albert Dürer in 1526. At this moment in time, while it was being painted, the Protestant Reformation was taking place. The artist Dürer converted from being a follower of the Pope in Rome to a follower of Martin Luther. Dürer cleverly depicts in the foreground the two apostles who were the favourites of Martin Luther, Paul and John. The apostle behind John, on the left side, is Peter, associated with the Pope. He is holding a large golden key, and John is showing him the Bible, pointing out that it should no longer be about church and about some key, golden key to heaven, but about man's relationship with God and God's word. On the right, you see Mark at the back almost on the lookout for looming danger, while Paul in front of him looks defensive also. It was a dangerous time, or it was about to be. States were going to fight wars with each other over religion. People were going to be killed, and they seem to almost be expecting the conflict that lies ahead. 